Welcome to a presentation on neoclassical physics. Neophysics has the most accurate theories of physics. We challenge you to disprove us. If not, we welcome you to join us and profit from the new science. In this presentation, we discuss about estimating the atmospheric back radiation effect on the surface temperature. That is, we try to estimate the real greenhouse effect which keeps our planet warm. In the standard method for estimating the mean surface temperature of Earth, it is assumed that 70% of the radiation reaching the top of the atmosphere is absorbed at the surface. However, from observations, we know that the surface absorbs only about 45% of the radiation, incoming radiation. Wrongly using 70%, the standard climate theory predicts an average temperature of 255 Kelvin on the Earth's surface in the absence of back radiation. With 45% absorption, the same theory predicts 228 Kelvin. Further, from the study of Moon, we discovered that the steady state radiative equilibrium equation inherently has an overestimation bias. When airless celestial objects are rotating fast, or when their diurnal cycles are short, they tend to have higher mean temperatures than objects with slower rotation. The radiative equilibrium equation implicitly assumes that assumes an infinite angular velocity by smearing out the incoming radiation on both day side and night side. On Moon, the standard theory overestimates the temperature by about 70 Kelvin. That is, it predicts 270 Kelvin, whereas the absurd mean surface temperature of Moon is only 200 Kelvin. The absurd mean surface temperature of Earth is 288 Kelvin. The net effect of the atmospheric back radiation is estimated as 288 minus 255, that is 33 Kelvin by climatologists. This 288 is from the observation and 255 is the estimate we did using 70% uh, absorption at the surface, assuming that 70% of the radiation is absorbed at the surface. This 255 is from that. So the climatologists in the standard textbooks, we see that the back radiation effect is about 33 Kelvin, 288 minus 255. But using the correct method, and the correct flux parameters, we find that the pack radiation effect must be about 288 minus 225, that is about 63 Kelvin, not 33 Kelvin as estimated. The textbooks have highly underestimated the natural back radiation effect. So this is a picture uh, used mainly for showing the distribution of the short wave radiation in different portions of the atmosphere this has taken this picture has been taken from this socratic dot arc the link has been mentioned here <coughs> so from the energy flux measurements on earth we find that the atmosphere also blocks some incoming solar radiation these two numbers here 19 and 4 that is total 23% is absorbed by the atmosphere and these three numbers here 8, 17 and 6 that is total 31% is reflected back to space. Hence the portion that really drives the temperature changes on the surface is this 46% absorbed by the surface. It is not 69 or 70%. By only taking the albedo effect on Earth, that is alpha equals 0.3, we may imagine that 30% solar radiation is reflected back to space and the rest 70% reaches the surface. But that would be wrong. We should consider only this 45 or 46% absorbed at the surface as the real input driving the temperature changes of the surface. Using 70% absorption here is a huge overestimation. According to the prevalent Climate 101 theory, the surface temperature of a celestial object in the solar system devoid of 
any atmosphere is determined by the following radiative equilibrium equation. So we have already seen this in the last uh, presentation. Pi r square i naught into 1 minus alpha equals 4 pi r square sigma t power 4. So here r is the radius of the object assumed to be spherical. I naught is the input solar radiation intensity at the top of the atmosphere. This is 1360 watt per meter square and it is valid for both moon and earth. Alpha is the albedo or the portion of radiation reflected back to space. T is the mean surface temperature of the celestial object. And sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Thus, we get the temperature, the mean uh, surface mean temperature from this equation as this T equals fourth root of I naught into 1 minus alpha by 4 sigma. This fourth root of 1 by 4 has been taken out and is written as this constant 0 0.7071 and the rest of the expression remains. Fourth root of I naught into 1 minus alpha by sigma. So this this factor inside the fourth root will appear in many places. So we have left it like this. So so this is the expression for uh, temperature using the standard textbook method. And you can find it in any any textbook or any standard lecture. So for example, you can check it out in the Yale courses YouTube channel or the University of Chicago uh, YouTube channel. Uh, you can see for these lectures 06 greenhouse effect hab habitability or lecture 5 the greenhouse effect to find these formulas. So ideally, the term 1 minus alpha in this formula, in this radiative equilibrium equation or in this temperature equation, it should represent absorptivity. That is the fraction of energy absorbed by the surface rather than a measure of the reflection from the top of the atmosphere. Because whatever the radiation absorbed by the surface is what drives the temperature of the surface. So we should consider that portion uh, properly. We should not consider an overestimation or an underestimation of it. So in this formula, in this temperature formula, if we use alpha equals 0.3, we get T equals 254.5 Kelvin. This is the usual uh, textbook estimate. And if we use alpha equals 0.55, uh, we get T equals the temperature, the surface mean temperature will be 227.9 Kelvin. This temperature, 255 Kelvin, is thought of as the temperature that the Earth would attain in the absence of the atmospheric back radiation effect. Estimation of the back radiation effect from the atmosphere and the greenhouse gases are made with reference to this temperature, this number 255 Kelvin. However, we know from the energy budget observations that the surface absorbs only about 45% of the incoming shortwave radiation not 70%. Therefore, using alpha equals 0.55 is more appropriate than using alpha equals 0.3. So this predicts uh, with alpha equals 0.55, we get that the base state, the base uh, mean surface temperature state is far lower than the predicted 255 Kelvin. From the study of moon's surface temperature, we discovered that the standard radiative equilibrium equations give wrong results. They predict the mean surface temperature of moon as 270 Kelvin, when the actual observations show a mean temperature of 200 Kelvin. We need to apply the radiative heat balance equations in a finite element form by splitting the surface of the moon into many tiny elemental pieces. The diurnal cycle has a large effect on the surface temperature estimation. Slower rotation rate implies lower temperature and faster rotation rate implies higher temperature of the celestial object, the mean surface temperature. So let us now use the elemental radiative energy balance equations that we used in case of moon. If the period of rotation or the period of diurnal cycle is x then for half the period between time 0 and x by 2 
there is active input of radiation from sun hence it is called the heating phase for the next half cycle between uh, time x by 2 and x there is no radiation input the rate of change of heat content of the elemental surface unit in this phase is just determined by the stefan boltzmann radiation loss this is the cooling phase rho h c del big t where t is the temperature big t is the temperature del t divided by uh, del small t where small t is the uh, time so del big t by del small t uh, indicates the rate of change of temperature and rho h c del t by del t is the rate of change of heat content of the material unit elemental material unit we will explain each of these symbols shortly so the elemental material unit interacting with the radiation is like this thin yellow slice in the figure there will be a heat transfer between the yellow region and the green material below it but the yellow and green region will also attain thermal equilibrium equilibrium and there will be a level or depth at which the temperature remains constant on the diurnal scale the dynamic region above this constant temperature level can be represented or thought of as a homogeneous uh, region with some characteristic scale height h and a temperature t this is like the boundary layer which interacts with the radiation so this is uh, shown in the figure here so in this heating and the cooling phase equations rho is the density of the surface material h is the height of the elemental surface unit c is the specific heat and x is the period which is uh, considered 24 hours in the case for earth and i not is the solar constant 1360 watt per meter square so we can calculate the temperature t as a function of latitude phi and uh, time small t that is we can find temperature t as a function of phi and t using these heating and cooling phase equations as such it is difficult to analyze this set of uh, equations heating and cooling equations to find the maximum minimum and the average temperatures but we can analyze some special cases one special case would be when the object is not rotating this can be considered as the case when period x equals infinity or the angular velocity is zero in this condition one side is always facing the sun and the other side never sees the sun so the heating cooling phase equations can be converted to this the time the factor involving time t 2 pi t by x this this factor is just replaced by cos theta where theta is the angle of the longitude uh, the uh, phi is the latitude and theta is the longitude uh, that is measured with respect to the center of that sphere so we uh, since there is no movement of the um, sun uh this uh, it's static uh staying over a particular location uh this time factor is not relevant anymore it is the um, the angle the the angle at which the incident ray is determined by just the the la latitude and the longitude angle so we have replaced the time factor with this cos theta here note that this is uh these equations are uh, approximations and they work by assuming that the sun is very very far compared to the radius of the object so in that uh, in that condition when the sun is considered very very far these approximations are good so we are using it under the uh, assumption uh, so so these two equations now represent the heating phase rather than the heating phase this is the heating phase which is the permanent day side and the cooling uh, phase is the permanent night side so this is uh, just an illustration of how the cooling and the heating side looks so this object is supposed to be not rotating so therefore the angular velocity is zero or uh, uh, we can consider the period as uh, infinity x equals infinity 
so on this side it's receiving the solar flux continuously and this is the hot bright side always facing the sun and this is the cold dark side which is always uh, facing away from the sun so and this object is stationary and this side will be hot and this side will be cold so assuming there is no horizontal or vertical exchange of heat energy that is only local energy balance over an infinite time the dark side reaches the equilibrium temperature of 0 kelvin everywhere on the dark side and the average bright side temperature at each latitude uh, phi is uh, determined by the heating phase equation that is uh, this is the heating phase equation uh, over the long time uh, they achieve equilibrium see the this t eq t underscore t subscript eq is uh, rep representing the equilibrium temperature that equilibrium uh, temperature so uh, since the temperature is not uh, changing del t by del t will be equal to zero so therefore this equation will be equal to zero so at uh, any latitude and longitude we can work out the equilibrium temperature using this expression fourth root of i not into 1 minus alpha cos theta cos phi divided by sigma so the fourth root of this expression so if we average the temperature along each latitude on both the bright side and the dark side that is we come calculate the complete uh, zonal average including both the dark and the bright uh, sides we get uh, tavg phi that is the average temperature at each latitude so we get this expression and uh, this expression we further find out the latitudinal average because we want the globally averaged surface temperature first we did the in the zonal average and then we do a meridional average or uh, average over all the latitude uh, values so when we average over all the latitude values we get this expression t of a t subscript a is 0.4021 into fourth root of i not into 1 minus alpha by sigma so this is the expression we get when the object is not rotating when the angular velocity is zero or the period is infinity another special case is uh, that can be analyzed is when the object is rotating very very fast this can be considered as the case when the period of rotation x is zero or the angular velocity is infinity so when the period x equals 0 or angular velocity is infinity in this condition the dark side will not get enough time to cool significantly and the bright side will not get time to warm significantly so in this case we can assume the radiation is smeared out evenly over the entire latitude circle and the temperature is determined and the temperature at each latitude is determined by this smeared out radiation incoming radiation and the temperature is same uh, along e at each latitude around a particular at each longitude around a particular latitude that is along a particular latitude there is a constant temperature but this temperature varies uh, has a latitudinal variation so as we go towards the pole the temperature might reduce but along one uh, latitude circle they all have the same temperature so the average radiation intensity at any latitude uh, will be we find this uh, latitudinal average we get uh, i average phi is 1 by pi i not 1 minus alpha cos phi so this is the zonal averaged radiation intensity averaged over both the bright and dark side this is the intensity Uh, received at any latitude on an average so this uh, will be equal this will determine the average surface temperature of that latitude and it will be related equal to i average of phi will be equal to sigma t average phi power 4 this is the stefan boltzmann loss expression so from this we get the uh, temperature Uh, average temperature value at each latitude so t average phi is i fourth root of i not into 1 minus alpha cos phi divided by pi into sigma 
so doing a latitudinal average or latitudinal integration of this we get the globally average surface temperature so we get ta t subscript a as 0 0.7016 into fourth root of i naught into one minus alpha by sigma so this is the value we get when the object is rotating very very fast that is the angular velocity is uh, sorry the object is uh, rotating very very slow the angular velocity is zero and the period of sorry again so the here the object is rotating very very fast the angular velocity is infinity and the period is zero Thus, from the same uh, solar constant and the uh, same albedo or absorptivity effect, we see a higher average temperature when the rotation rate is very fast. That is, when the angular velocity is infinite and the or the period of rotation is zero, we get a higher temperature estimate. That is, T subscript A is 0 0.7016 into I naught into 1 minus alpha by sigma, fourth root of that. And we see a lower average temperature when the rotation rate is slow. That is, the angular velocity is zero and uh, the period is infinity. So in this case, we get T subscript A, that is the globally average surface temperature as 0 0.4021, fourth root of I naught into one minus alpha by sigma. The estimate by standard textbook method is T subscript A is 0 0.7071 into this expression, the fourth root of this. So T of A, which is 0 0.7071 uh, into fourth root of I naught into one minus alpha by sigma. This this expression is slightly higher than the maximal average temperature possible when the angular velocity is infinite. That is given by this 0 0.7016 into this expression. Zonally smearing out radiation over both dark and bright side is valid when the rotation rate is fast enough. The standard textbook estimate is close to the approximation when angular velocity is equal to infinity or the period of uh, rotation is zero. Hence, it does not work well for moon because moon rotates very slowly. In general, depending on the density rho, value of h, a value of c and the value of period x, Depending on these values, the surface average temperature lies somewhere in the domain 0.4 into fourth root of this expression to 0.7 into fourth root of expression. This expression. So, this 0.4 into this expression gives the minimum temperature, uh, and 0.7 into this expression gives the maximum temperature. So, we find this minima when the rotation rate is slow, and we find this maximum temperature when the rotation rate is uh, fast. So this uh, domain is basically determined by the rate of rotation. So purely uh, we get the minima when the rotation rate is slow, we get maxima when the rotation rate is fast. So uh, we, can ex uh, we can estimate different um, minima and maxima under different conditions. So for moon with alpha equals 0 0.11, moon means the period of rotation is 28, 29 days. So for moon, we get the minima as 153.7 Kelvin and the maxima as 268.2 Kelvin. That is, if the moon's rotation rate were to be very, very slow, then its average temperature would be just 153.7 Kelvin, very cold. And if its rotation rate was too fast, then its average some, uh, surface temperature would be 268.2 Kelvin. The standard textbook prediction is 270 Kelvin, which is outside this minimum maximum range. But the observed temperature is about 200 Kelvin, which is well within the range that we predict. For Earth, with uh, alpha equals 0 0.3, we get a minima of 144.7 Kelvin and a maxima of 252.6 Kelvin. 
so the uh, standard textbook prediction we get is uh, 254.5 kelvin which is nothing but this expression 0.7071 into this fourth root so this is the textbook estimate and this is larger than even the upper limit of the minima maxima that we predict so the maxima we get from our method is 252.6 and uh, the temperature predicted by the standard method is 254.5 so the textbook method is uh, overestimating the value by around 2 kelvin similarly when alpha equals 0.55 we get uh, the minima as 129.6 and the maxima as 226.6 and the uh, we can see the textbook method is overestimating the textbook method predicts 227.9 kelvin while the maxima we get is 226.1 kelvin so there is a difference of 1.8 kelvin that is the uh, the value predicted by the standard textbook method is outside the range by 1.8 kelvin when we estimate the actual t of a that is the globally averaged surface temperature using the elemental radiative energy balance equations in a finite element form these differences this 1.8 1.9 kelvin these will further go up and uh, the difference between the standard theory and the time evolving finite element method becomes a bit larger than this and we get about 2.5 kelvin this 2.5 kelvin is as such uh, pretty low this is low because earth is rotating very fast already for moon this difference turns out to be 70 kelvin because uh, moon is rotating very slow so let us now use a proper finite element method to estimate the average temperature again we assume the energy balance is happening locally at every point and there is no heat transfer either horizontally or vertically so first let us use the same soil layer that we used in case of moon in the previous presentation so for this density rho is once uh, 1600 kg per meter cube the characteristic height is 0.1 meter specific heat c is 730 joule per kg ke per kelvin and the only difference between the moon case and the earth case are these albedo values albedo alpha is taken as 0.55 here and the period is taken as 24 hours and in case of moon alpha was 0.11 and the period of oscillation was 28 29 days from the heating and the cooling equations we get the local surface temperature t of phi of t t of phi t the dis temperature as a function of latitude and time t small t so this t of phi t is as shown in the top panel figure we see that the average surface temperature of the soil layer at the equator is 238.4 kelvin and the range of temperature that is t max minus t min is quite high 73 kelvin the maxima is about 277.6 kelvin and the minima is 204.5 kelvin and the difference between them is 73 kelvin the bottom panel shows the time average temperature that is t average as a function of phi uh, that is as a function of latitude and we see that the t average phi can be approximated by this expression this equation so t average phi is t average 0 that is uh, whatever the value of temperature at the equator t average 0 multiply by 4.2th root of this cos cos phi or the cos of this latitude angle so cos to the power of 1 by 2 into this uh, temperature at the equator will give the average temperature average latitude nearly uh, longitude nearly average temperature at each latitude t average phi so therefore the overall surface temperature can be expressed in these two formats 
so this t a one is just the simple average uh, we know if we know the t average phi at each uh, latitude angle phi we can multiply it with cos phi d phi and find out the um, average uh, latitudinal average and uh, t a one is not exact because of the course spatial resolution used for integration so we have this d phi is about 0.5 degrees this is course because calculating t average phi at each latitude is computationally expensive so we have resorted to this course 0.5 degree re resolution and the other method of estimating this uh, Uh, is using this equation t average phi had this cost to the power of 1 by 2 1 by 4.2 dependence so we can use that to estimate the total uh, area average or the average over the spherical area so ta2 becomes this which gives about 0.937 times the average temperature at the equator so from this uh, direct uh, averaging we get 223.8 kelvin and from this method we get 224.1 kelvin this has very high resolution but ta2 is also not exact because this relationship is only approximate we don't know whether the power cost to the power of it should be 4.2 or 4.21 or 4.19 so this is this is also an approximation so these both are uh, approximations but both the estimates are close by they predict around 224 kelvin as the uh, globally average surface mean temperature for this soil layer so here the average temperature is 255 minus 224 that is 31 kelvin lower than the textbook estimate of 255 kelvin So here the average temperature we are predicting as 224 Kelvin the textbook predicts 255 Kelvin so we are 31 Kelvin lower than the textbook prediction Thus if this is true the real effect of the atmosphere should be to lift the average temperature from about 224 Kelvin uh that is 224 Kelvin without the back radiation effect to 288 Kelvin with back radiation effect that is a total rise in temperature of 64 kelvin that should be the effect of the back radiation effect to raise the temperature of the surface by 64 kelvin but according to the textbooks it is only 288 minus 255 that is 33 kelvin so this 255 was calculated using uh, the assumption that 70% of the incoming radiation is absorbed at the surface but uh, it's only 45% that is a Uh, absorbed at the surface so anyway this is a very uh, underestimation this 288 minus 245 this 33 kelvin the textbook estimate 33 kelvin for the back radiation effect is uh, highly underestimated since much of the earth is covered with water we could consider a surface layer with water instead of soil let us assume density rho is 1000 kg per meter cube height is 1 meter specific heat is 4181 joule per kg per kelvin and for the sake of calculations let us assume that the density specific heat and phase of the water layer remains unchanged during this whole process during this whole heating and cooling so the top panel shows the evolution of the local water temperature t of phi t in this single layer model so here uh, temperature is shown as a function of uh, latitude phi and time t and the bottom panel shows the relationship of uh, t average phi with uh, respect to latitude phi so we see that the surface average temperature for the water layer at equator is now 242.1 kelvin which is higher than the soil layer temperature which was about 238.4 kelvin and the range of temperature that is t max minus t min in this case is only 2.2 kelvin so the t max is 243.2 kelvin and the t min is 241 kelvin so the difference between the maxima and the minima is just 2.2 kelvin whereas the range we saw in the soil layer case was 73 kelvin 
so water uh, cannot exist in this in the liquid state under these low temperature condition that is just average temperature of 242.1 kelvin the two at the equator so water cannot exist in liquid state under under these conditions we shall consider ice phase equations later However, note that in this uh, case, the bottom panel shows the T average expression approximation and T average phi is almost exactly going as the fourth root of the cos of latitude or co fourth root of cos phi. So T average in this case is nothing but the T average at the equator multiplied by fourth root of cos of latitude. So therefore, the overall average expression can be calculated using these two methods. The one is just direct averaging, but it it is coarse resolution, and uh, the other one is uh, high resolution uh, integration. But uh, the relationship uh, may be approximate. That is the relationship of t average uh, phi as a function of the latitude. So. Both the expression, both this method gives uh, results which are close by. So here the average surface temperature is about uh, 29 Kelvin lower. That is 255 minus 226. So we predict 226 for this water layer. For the soil layer, it was about 224 uh, Kelvin. For this water layer, it is about uh, 226 Kelvin. For the ice, if we measure uh, by assuming density as 918.7 kg per meter cube and uh, height is 1 meter and uh, specific heat is uh, 2090 joule per kg per kelvin, with these values, we actually get the same average values as the water. Only the T max and the T mean, the temperature max and this range changes, but the average up to two decimal places remains the same as this water as this uh, calculated for the water that is t a1 uh, remains 226.4 and 2 t a2 remains 226.1 and the averages also remain the same and uh, so on we get the same averages for ice because the product rho at c for ice is 1.92 into 10 power 6 and this is very close to the product uh, rho hc for water which is 4.181 into 10 power 6 whereas the product of the soil rho hc of the soil is quite less at least one order less than these two products therefore the values of uh, ice and water are close by at least the average values and the soil layer value is quite different and uh, even the range is much higher for this soil because the rho hc product is less so in the textbook method if we use alpha equals 0.55 we get the uh, globally average surface temperature ta as 288 kelvin this is from the uh, textbook method you just using alpha equals 0.55 but using the proper uh, radiative heat balance method in the finite element form we get with the soil layer and alpha equals 0.55 we get the average temperature ta as 224 kelvin this is dry soil and uh, with water layer alpha equals 0.55 we get ta as 226.5 kelvin so if we consider the earth surface consisting of both water and soil layers it's a mixture of both then the uh, then with alpha equals 0.55 we get we should get some value somewhere between this uh, 224 and 226.5 because it's a combination of both water and soil layers so we can say somewhere like 225.5 kelvin so we'll just assume this as the uh, temperature produced by the combination of water and soil layers so this also implies that a concrete or an asphalted surface may actually cool the mean surface temperature because we saw this dry soil layer has lower temperature than this water layer it has 224 kelvin and it has uh, that is the dry soil layer 
and the water layer has higher 226.5 so this also implies this concreted or the asphalted surfaces may actually cool the mean surface temperature even though the daytime maxima may be much higher because the night time will be much cooler So there is a difference uh, of about uh, 2.5 Kelvin. That is 226.5 minus 224 Kel uh, Kelvin. That is 2.5 Kelvin just due to the assumption of different kinds of earth surface. That is whether we consider dry soily land surface or water surface. That uh, itself causes uh, quite a bit of change in the estimation of the surface mean temperature. Thus, the surface type parameterization or how we model it and the land use changes can, quise, uh, can cause quite a significant change in the average temperature estimate independent of any atmospheric back radiation or greenhouse gas effect. On top of this, the textbook method overestimates the surface average temperature by a few degrees. That is, uh, 228 is the standard uh, method estimation using alpha uh, equals 0.55 and uh, 225.5 is the is the prediction estimated prediction using a combination of soil and water layers. So there is about uh, difference of 2.5 uh, Kelvin between the textbook method and uh, the correct uh, radiative balance method this error the uh, this error is bigger than uh, the supposed temperature change due to greenhouse gases therefore in light of these estimation errors and the surface un uncertainties that is there is one uh, uncertainty due to uh, the kind of surface included or how we parameterize the surface that itself causes a quite a bit of uncertainty which is of the order of 2.5 Kelvin plus the model the textbook uh, equation overestimates there is an error of two two and a half Kelvin compared to the correct way of solving that equation so because of these two factors which is uh, already greater than the temperature change due to greenhouse effect we it is not reasonable to believe the greenhouse gas effect calculated based on these erroneous terms another notable feature is the lower surface temperature that is 238.4 kelvin in case of soil layer is associated with greater temperature extremes that is T max minus T min is 73 Kelvin. Even though the average is less, the temperature extreme is greater. While the higher surface uh, temperature, 242.1 Kelvin, in case of water layer, is associated with uh, much smaller temperature extremes. That is T max minus T min in case of this higher temperature is just 2.2 Kelvin. So that is the higher average temperature is not associated with more extreme temperatures, but it is associated with less extremes, less temperature extremes. So this may have some uh, implications for the way we model and understand the climate change uh, phenomena. So because the higher average temperatures here are associated with less temperature extremes. <coughs> Most importantly, when the base state of mean temperature is about 225 Kelvin, because alpha is 0 0.55 instead of 255 Kelvin, which we get with alpha equals 0 0.3, <coughs> the standard idealized Greenhouse theory calculations fail to give the desired results. That is because the base state temperature is much lower it is now 225 kelvin we cannot just simply apply this idealized greenhouse gas theory to get the desired results that is the desired result of 288 kelvin at the uh, as the surface temperature of the earth so we cannot just simply get it by using the standard greenhouse theory so from the idealized greenhouse theory uh, 
idea let us consider one layer atmosphere that is uh, a one layer of the atmosphere lying on top of the surface layer so we get the following expressions for the surface and air uh, layer temperatures you can consult any standard textbook and uh, even wiki has a proper coverage of this so from uh, this one layer atmosphere there is one layer of atmosphere and one surface layer so with this we get the uh, greenhouse effect as this this is the the t surface temperature is determined by this uh, i not into 1 minus alpha by 4 sigma these factors we already saw there is one extra factor 1 minus epsilon by 2 and surface is the fourth root of this whole expression here the this ex, uh, this symbol epsilon is the emissivity of the air air layer so air layer uh, has this emissivity epsilon and the air temperature is simply given by the surface temperature divided by fourth fourth root of 2 so this is fairly simple we are not showing the derivation so this is what we get from the standard uh, idealized greenhouse theory with one surface layer and one atmospheric layer so in this expression if uh, alpha equals 0.3 and uh, epsilon the emissivity is 0.78 we get the textbook estimate so we get the uh, surface temperature as 288 kelvin which is uh, rising from 255 this becomes from 255 kelvin without the atmospheric layer if you put an atmospheric layer and uh, assume the greenhouse effect then uh, instead of 255 it gives the surface temperature becomes 288 kelvin and uh, while the air temperature becomes 242.2 kelvin but the surface absorbs only 45 percent of the incident radiation effectively alpha should be 0.55 if we assume no change in intensity that is epsilon is still 0.78 and we change the albedo this alpha is 0.55 then we get very low surface mean temperatures that is uh, the new t surf with this new alpha equals 0.55 uh, we get uh, the temperature as 257.9 here the base state was 228 and even if it uh, rises uh, by similar amount uh, using the same formula it just predicts 257.9 as the final surface temperature of the earth instead of 288 kelvin so this is very low and it is not possible to get a one layer atmosphere uh, idealized greenhouse model to explain 288 kelvin with alpha equals 0.55 because in order to get 288 kelvin we need to use an emissivity of 1.22 which is greater than 1 so it is physically impossible so with this same formula and starting with 228 kelvin if we want to end up with 288 kelvin the amount of uh, greenhouse effect this uh, emissivity required is uh, larger than 1 so this is impossible so we cannot have a one layer uh, a model uh, simulating this the one layer model cannot uh, show a raise from 228 kelvin to 288 kelvin so let us now check out a two layer model that is uh, these are the two layers this is the air layer one uh, with temperature t air one and emissivity epsilon one and air layer two with temperature t air two and uh, emissivity epsilon two so this is the surface t surf is the surface temperature so so these are the expression we are not showing the derivation is showed in a paper attached with this paper you can check that out in our website so these are the final expressions we get for uh, t air one the air temperature of the first layer air temperature of the second layer and uh, the surface temperature in terms of epsilon one and epsilon two and in this case the total radiation escaping from the surface the radiation escaping from the surface to the free space is uh, given by this expression 1 minus epsilon 1 into 1 minus epsilon 2 into sigma uh, into fourth uh, power of uh, surface temperature and the radiation escaping from the first layer of the atmosphere is this this is from the surface this is from the first layer of the atmosphere is this and the net radiation escaping from 
this system from the first and the second layer is just the summation of these two terms. This is this. Suppose we fix the T surf uh, temperature as 288 Kelvin. That is, we want uh, the surface temperature to be 288 Kelvin. So let's fix T surf as 288 Kelvin. And uh, uh, we use alpha as 0.55 because only 45% of the radiation is absorbed at the surface. So using these uh, values, we get uh, 4 into this factor here, this factor which determines the surface temperature, 4 minus epsilon 1 epsilon 2 divided by 2 minus epsilon 1 into this 2 minus epsilon 2. This expression uh, gets the value of 2.55. So there are, as we can note, there are infinite solutions where uh, we get uh, values for epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 satisfying this equation. So one possible solution is when epsilon 1 is equal to epsilon 2 is equal to 0 0.8732. So in this case, we get the air 1 temperature as 258.8, uh, the layer 2 air temperature as 221.2, and the surface temperature is fixed to 88 Kelvin. So in this uh, situation, in, for this solution, epsilon 1 equals epsilon 2, this 0 0.8732, we get only 8.8% 8 .8 total loss from these two layers. That is the outgoing uh, long wave radiation from these two layers. Only 8.8% 8 .8 of this uh, long wave radiation crosses the second air layer and reaches the outer space. And in that, only 1.6% loss from the surface layer. The surface is uh, losing only 1.6% of the long wave radiation. Rest 99.4 um, is, 98.4 is getting absorbed in the atmosphere. And another solution is when epsilon 1, the radi emissivity, or the emissivity of the first layer is 1 and the emissivity of the second layer is 0 0.7097. In this case, we get these temperatures, but uh, importantly, we get net 17.65% loss, loss from the two layers, that is the long wave radiation loss reaching the space, but only 0% loss from the surface layer. So the, there is no radiation from the long wave, um, uh, there is no long wave radiation from the surface that is reaching the outer space, crossing the second air layer, mm -hmm. according to this model. So the main drawback of this two-layer model is it does not predict the correct number for the surface long-wave radiation lost to space. Even though most of the surface radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere, it is estimated that the surface loses more than 10% of its long-wave radiation to free space. Here in the two-layer greenhouse model, the maximum loss estimate from the surface is only about 1.6%, which we get when epsilon 1 is epsilon 2 is equal to 0 0.8732. So only in this condition, we get the maximum uh, uh, surface lo uh, loss of long wave radiation from the surface, and the maximum is just 1.6%. It's not even crossing 10%. So therefore, these estimates are wrong because they are getting the wrong value of the Wrong, uh, long wave radiation loss to the free space. They don't do not match the observation. So uh, these estimates are wrong, and uh, therefore we need to consider proper coupled equations, and also we may need to consider the effect of heat transport. So these uh, uh, sets of equation here shows the proper heating and cooling phase equation for the coupled um, uh, equations coupled situation so this is the heating phase this is for the first layer the, the you can consider it as the surface layer and this is the layer above it this is the air layer so these two coupled equation these two have to be <laughs> solved uh, or simulated simultaneously during the heating phase and these two determine the uh, heat change of the first layer and the second layer during during the cooling phase so they are also coupled so we have to actually use these equations to get the correct estimates of the surface temperature and the back radiation effect. So in this uh, presentation, we argued that 255 Kelvin, that is uh, estimated assuming the radiation absorbed at the, 70, at the surface as 
is wrong. On an average, we should assume that the surface absorbs only 45% of the incoming radiation as the data shows. We also saw how the steady state uh, radiative equilibrium equation has an overestimation bias because it implicitly assumes an infinite angular velocity. We should use the energy balance equation in a finite element format to get the correct effect depending on the actual period x. Actual period of rotation. So yeah, the temperature, uh, the surface average temperature depends on the actual period x and we have to use this uh, better method, the finite element method, the radiative heat balance to get that. So these two errors, that is overestimating radiation absorbed at the surface and implicitly assuming a very fast rotation are the two major overestimation factors in the standard theory. Using corrections for the above two errors, we get the base state mean surface temperature estimate as of around 225.5 Kelvin which is much less than the 255 Kelvin estimated by the standard theory by assuming uh, alpha equals 0.3 or 70% uh, radiation absorption at the surface. This estimate 225.5 Kelvin is lower even than the 228 Kelvin estimated by the standard theory with alpha equals 0.55 or assuming 45% uh, absorption of radiation at the surface. So this is even less than the estimate done you, uh, by assuming a 45% absorption at the surface by the standard theory. From this base state that is around 225 Kelvin, from this base state using idealized greenhouse theory we cannot get the necessary temperature rise from 225.5 Kelvin to 288 Kelvin that we showed here that is the that is a raise of 62.5 kelvin so basically the greenhouse theory is not equipped to predict this raise of 62.5 kelvin from 225.5 kelvin to 288 we cannot use any of these greenhouse models to get that raise so textbooks highly underestimate the effect of natural back radiation as only 33 kelvin it is possibly more than 60 Kelvin. So how do we get the correct back radiation effect and how do we raise the surface temperature from about 225 Kelvin to 288 Kelvin. So this will be the topic for future presentations. We stop that here. Thank you. If you want to understand the concepts of physics in the clearest way, regardless of the concerns about scoring high marks in exams, please visit neophysics.com. Thank you again.